Seeing the any of the webinars or anything on the club grant program, how many people are familiar or know anything about it? A few folks, right? So just a little bit of background. Um, the ARL Foundation, um, about a year ago now, um, worked with ARDC and got a half a million dollars a grant, basically, with the charge to basically dispense that money to amateur radio clubs. Now, the program, which is basically something that Mike Walters and I worked on and created, um, is designed to benefit all radio clubs. You don't have to be ARL affiliated, you don't have to be a nonprofit, you just have to be a radio club that wants to do some good work for amateur radio. And the way we, we set this program up, we're looking to give grants up to $25,000 to clubs that want to do work that will, be, will, what people have called transformational, which means basically programs that are going to benefit clubs, hams, and the public around the club. So we're trying to use this money to enable people to do programs that are going to make amateur radio stronger and also make the public aware of what amateur radio can do. Those are kind of top priorities. Also, there's money for club stations. If they're available to a broader community, there's money for people who want to help him solve RFI problems. There's money for people who want to do programs and work in schools. Um, there's also a, a small grant element to this for up to $2,000 for clubs who are struggling and need a little bit of money to kind of do a restart. We call that a club revitalization grant. Now, when we set this up, we set it up to be dispensed in two rounds this year. The first round is complete. It just wrapped up. We gave 24 grants, totally $270,000, and to clubs all over the United States. Okay, Several clubs here in New England received grants, some $25,000. The second uh, round, which we call tranches, if you guys go watch the webinar, just started up. Uh, Mike Walters and I did the kickoff webinar last Wednesday to kind of get everybody briefed. That's on the web if you want to go watch it and see how the program works and what we're trying to do. We also had a lot of feedback in there for um, some of the clubs that didn't make it in the first round but got close and some of the things that we saw that kind of held some of the applications back a little bit. The second round will close on November 4th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. So if you're interested in doing a project um, and getting a club grant for it, you've got plenty of time to do the application. There's an online process that you basically fill out an application, kind of using the same tools that the foundation uses for scholarship applications, plus some additional stuff that we created so we can understand what the projects are. Now to give you a feel for the response, for the first round, we had 128 applications totaling over $1.7 million. So we were pretty heavily oversubscribed. David Minster, our CEO, went back to the ARDC immediately and said, can we have more money? And the feedback from ARDC was, we want to see how you do with the transformational stuff, and then we'll talk about more money. Okay. So right now we're in the process of going through the second round, getting all the money out. The checks, by the way, for the first round have already gone out. They went out yesterday. Mike Walters literally sent out over a quarter million dollars worth of checks. So folks that got grants here in New England will be receiving those checks probably in the next couple days. So it's a great opportunity if you want to do something big. I know you guys were thinking a little bit about maybe remote stations and some of that kind of stuff. There is definitely money for projects like that. But you have to design it in such a way that it's aimed not only at your group, but the, the people around you to try to get people on the air, get people more active at amateur radio, do training and that kind of stuff. Some of the kind of things that got grants, there's one club that's doing a program to help other clubs kind of become stronger and do new things. That one got a pretty good sized grant. We gave some small grants to schools. One school that wants to put up an antenna and get a school station started, we gave a grant for that. That fits in pretty well with our criteria. And the way the process works is when, you're when you submit your application, we have a scoring model that looks at all the aspects of being transformational and it also looks at your ability to kind of execute and do the accounting associated with a grant. The thing that ranks who gets grants is the transformational part. The execution part is just a check to make sure, especially if we hand out a check for $25,000, that it looks like the folks that are getting it can handle that kind of money effectively and associated equipment. When the grants come in, um, Mike divides them up into three groups. We have three teams that score grants. There's an effort to make sure that nobody scores a grant with any club they're connected with. 
Okay, so for example, there were, I'm, a, I'm head of one of those three teams, the scoring teams. Mike is head of one, Steve Goodgame at headquarters is the third person that leads the teams. And there are folks, some club presidents, some former treasurers involved in scoring grants, and some other people that kind of have a, a history of doing club stuff and you know, know what to look for. Every grant is scored by at least three people. Those numbers are rolled up, they're normalized, and then we pretty much rank order people by the scores and that's who get grants. So it's a pretty objective process, I think. And a lot of effort's gone in to make sure it's fair and you know, there's nothing that's gonna happen that's not appropriate. So that's the club grant program. Do you, do you guys have any questions about it? Any comments, reactions, anything at all? Who else locally tried to get grants and how much did they I, get? That's I have to. Today? I have a list to, to look at. Um, I know Barnstable Club got one. I think a pretty sizable one. Um, the uh, the club in Meriden got a grant. Um, I think there are three or four here in New England that received grants. I think did K Ban get one as well? I think K Ban might have gotten one. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I have a list. K Ban did get one. Yeah, yeah. So uh, New England did very, very well in the grand scheme of things. So what kind of projects have you seen this go towards? What, what are people looking to spend money on? Well, so like you, some you of the things I mentioned, like the one club, I, I think it, the, the Meriden Club is doing a training program for clubs, other clubs and other groups. That got a, a pretty sizable grant. What, what does that mean? To They're going to put together to materials up. to help other clubs do activities that make them help them be successful. They're going to do some work in schools. They're going to do some outreach in community centers to try to get more minorities and, and underrepresented groups in amateur radio. They have a whole program laid out to do that kind of work and resources and so on, radios and other things to support their program. That's an example of what we mean by somebody who's got a transformational project. When they execute all that, they're not only going to help their club, they're going to help a lot of people around them. And that's really the kind of project that we're looking to fund here because obviously that makes the money have the maximum amount of impact. What about revitalization? How about an example? It, yeah, so let's take a club, maybe, you know, I, 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 I don't have a specific example, but I'll give you an example of the kind of club this is. Let's say a club had a place where maybe they met in a church, they lost their meeting place, they're down to five or six members, they haven't been able to recruit anybody in a long time, the president or somebody on the board steps back and says, you know, we need a little money to find a new place to meet and start over again. Okay. okay, that's what that's about. Now, there's two other elements of this program. There is a club coach which gets assigned to those specific folks, and that's typically an experienced club president or officer to help the club that gets a revitalization grant figure out how to get themselves back on their feet. Mm -hmm. There's also another role called a club coach where if somebody had a good project but maybe they didn't quite get over the top and they want to improve their application the second round, Mike Walters will assign somebody to work with them to help them figure out how to do more transformational stuff and get over the top. All right, so you have a point is to get to a transformational type. That's exactly right. Category. And you know, for the clubs that are doing this kind of stuff, that are getting these grants, it's a huge shot in the arm because it gives them a, a project, a cause, to get their group and their club excited about and you know, draw more people in and it's all good, it really is. Well, a key in, a, attribute of that too is, is the advisory um, function that you guys are going to perform for some of these clubs. Because you could hand them money, they might have a good idea, but they not have any clue as to how, how to go about it. That's yeah. exactly right. You know, one other thing, I'm going to get a little off topic, Bruce, I, I'm overstaying my time, just yell at me. But one of the other things that I'm working on, there's a committee, in, a board committee that got formed about a year ago called the Emergency Communications and Field Services Committee. And that the board created that committee specifically to revamp emergency communications, field services, and the club system. Which, by the way, quite frankly, the ARL has neglected pretty badly over the last 10 years, and a lot of stuff is in disrepair as a result of that. One of the things I'm working on there is I'm, we're running a work group, David Norris, uh, Mark Tharp, uh, Steve Goodgame, Mike Walters, we're all on this thing, and we're putting together a series of webinars to try to help clubs figure out how to develop volunteers, how to develop new activities, how to modernize their operational procedures, how to become 501c3s, how to revamp their websites, and we're going to be looking for people from clubs who have been successful at these things 
to come in and deliver these webinars. There's a, it's still pretty early. We've been only working on this for a few weeks at this point. We're hoping to be able to launch it before the end of the year. And there'll probably be maybe 15 different topics in this series, all designed to try to help strengthen the club system. So again, that's coming back to the idea that we're trying to get all of you to strengthen amateur radio, get the word out in the communities around you about why this is important. And hopefully that will step up the game for everybody. Big E. Big E. Okay, great. So how many people know what the Big E is? Anybody? Yeah, good. Good sign. So Big E is the sixth largest regional fair in the United States. It attracts about 1.2 million attendees over a two and a half week period every year. The daily attendance ranges anywhere from 30,000 to 90,000 people. So, um, uh, Larry W1AST, who runs a club here in Massachusetts, um, built on a program that was actually started by, by Betsy Dolan and other folks in Connecticut a long time ago, and got an arrangement with the Big E to have an amateur radio booth to showcase amateur radio at the fair. Okay? The Big E gave us space and quite a bit of facilities to do that. And starting on Monday, um, there will be um, folks in that booth, all volunteers from clubs, basically there to talk to the public and feature amateur radio. There's also a program where um, that clubs can, basically people who come by the booth and, and are interested in amateur radio will get referred to the clubs that are supporting the booth for membership. So there's an element of this to build club membership up as well. So when that whole project got started, Phil Temples and I looked at that and said, you know what, this would be a perfect place to do a space station contact. Because we have a huge number of people that potentially would come and see that. It'd be a great way, if you remember when I was here at Kennedy and I, we talked a lot about the importance of getting the public to be aware and appreciate the value of amateur radio, remember that? This is an example of how we're trying to do that. So we worked with the Big E, we sat down with the CEO of the exposition and his whole staff, gave them a, a good pitch on amateur radio, and they got really excited about it. They gave us the biggest arena in the Biggie. It holds like 5,000 people to do this contact in. It's got, they basically use it for rock concerts. We've got a production company called Black Helicopter who volunteered to produce the pre-contact program for us. And these guys are people who like work with ESPN to produce draft day and stuff like that. So it should be a pretty professional operation. Aris scrambled and uh, arranged for us to have a contact. We offered an education program through New England SciTech. You guys are probably some of you are familiar with what Bob Finney does. There's a whole program that is going to go on. It's already started for about a year where you can do astronomy, build electronics projects, do CubeSat work, do telescope nights. There's a couple rounds of amateur radio classes in there. All of it's for free. Some of it is online. So if you know of young folks, anybody that's like 18 years or less, that's interested anywhere in New England in being part of this program, it's free. All you need to go do is go to SciTech's website and sign up. We've got 13 kids from all around New England that are gonna participate in this contact. And here's breaking news. We don't have a firm date, but I just got an update from NASA and from Aris today that says the contact will probably be Tuesday afternoon, the 27th starting at about 2 o'clock. Now that may still change, but I would say it's about 70% certain that will be the date and time. We will know for sure when it's going to happen by Monday or Tuesday next week. Now here's the best part. The Big E folks are so excited about getting the public to see what we're doing and also to put a, a more high-tech face on pumpkins and pigs and all the kinds <laughs> of things that are normally at fairs. The CEO, when we did the brief, turned to his staff and said, we're going to let amateur radio operators and three other family members in for free on the day of the Big E so they can come and fill the arena and see this. So we've gotten tremendous support. The Big E literally has printed, is planning to print 50,000 flyers for inserts into their day of brochures to let people know about this and call attention to it. They're lining up TV stations to cover it. So it should be a huge opportunity for us to expose the public to amateur radio. Speakers, David Minster is going to be part of the program. The CEO of the Big E is going to be part of the program. Bob Finney from SciTech is going to be part of the program. It will start about 45 minutes before contact time. 
include a whole bunch of videos about space science that are inspired, intended to inspire the kids and the public. We'll go through the speakers and then we'll have them talk to the astronaut. So if you're not doing anything on a week from next Tuesday, um, come on down to the Big E, bring some of your family and friends, check out the amateur radio booth, and, uh, and watch the kids talk to the astronaut. It should be, uh, should be quite an experience. But, yeah. Any questions, comments on that? So remember, it's for free on the day of the Ares contact. Yep. But the Big E runs for two weeks. Yep, correct. And you have to bring an official copy, like you know, the one you can get off of the FCC website. Just print it out and bring that with your license. You show it at the gate, and you'll get in free. You still have to pay to park, but you'll be able to get into the event. I, I don't know. That saves you fifteen or twenty bucks or something. Plus, with three of your family members, it probably saves you more. Are the kids asking any questions of the astronauts? Oh yeah. There's a list of about 20 questions that have been created to be asked by 13 kids. And uh, that data, the way this process works, I'm, one of the other things I do is I'm part of the ARIS program that does these contacts. I'm what's called an ARIS mentor. I also have one of the worldwide ground stations. And we go through a whole process to help make sure the education program goes right, that all the planning for the venue and the PA, there's going to be a live stream which is being, going to be widely publicized, that all that's set up and done properly. There, there is a package of material that each group creates that's a little bit of information about them, so in this case about SciTech and the kids, the names, the grades of the kids, the, the 20 questions in this case, all that gets bundled up into what's called an uplink document, and then actually gets sent up to the space station as a brief for the astronaut. So that's kind of how the process works to prepare for one of these things. It's actually a big deal. Some years ago, Embark did the same. Yeah. yeah. You know, that might be something interesting for you guys to try and do again. If you're interested in doing a project like that with a local youth group, um, I'll probably end up being your mentor if you get a contact. So I'd be happy to help you, you know, figure out how to apply for that if you want to do it again. I think, how long is the satellite out there? I've never done it, but how long is the pass for that? It's typically 10 to 12 minutes. It's like you're packing a lot of stuff in with Oh, it, well, uh, the pre-contact, all the speakers and stuff happen before the contact to kind of get everybody excited. You know, I've been involved in a bunch of these, both as kind of the, the, the coach, the mentor, and also as one of the ground stations. Um, I just, one of them most recently was with a, a Boy Scout group in Victoria, Australia. And they kind of connected into my station here in Hollis um, via telephone connection, and I provided the radio up and down link to the space station. That's kind of how this works. Our space station, our contact, by the way, our ground station for this one is going to be in Belgium. So we will hook the big E up via telephone connection to a station in Belgium. Oh, so the pass won't, won't be over. The well, it won't be over. The, won't be over the big E. No, yeah. it won't be. So uh, and you know maybe sometimes you guys are interested in this. I'll come back and give you a little presentation on how all this stuff works. It's kind of an interesting yeah that would program. Be good time. It really is. And then, by the way, the other good thing about this, some of the contacts are involved collaborating with a local amateur radio club like yours to actually build the ground station. Skip remembers us doing this at, at Boxborough testing our equipment to get ready for one of the contacts we did here in New Hampshire. If you need an excuse to build a really nice satellite ground station. This might be an opportunity for you. Um, any other questions for Fred? Because I want to. I'm probably I'm trying to move on. I'm sorry, Bruce. That's okay. By the way, if y'all have any other stuff about the ARL or comments or feedback or anything, that's what I'm here to hear. So you know, either ask now or pull me aside later on and bend my ear. Okay. Thank you.